All you have to do if you want to become famous is to discover the oldest archaeological site in some eastern country. People love discoveries, exceptional things. And this is where we are right now. Uh, it happened here at Gobekli, Gobekli Tepe, in Turkey, not far from the city of Samli Urfa and Haran, where Abram used to live. Besides coming here by their hundreds in buses, the plains also are packed with tourists flying down to see this latest and greatest discovery in 2019. And if you cannot get to the actual site of Kobeki Tepe, you can see a display of some of the discoveries that's exhibited in a modern new museum. It's, it's the most beautiful museum I've ever seen. It's just built, beautiful, outside and inside. The oldest objects of Gobekli Tepe are displayed here. Look at this. <laughs> what do you think of this creature? Many interesting objects on display. Unfortunately, there are no explanation to enlighten you. So people come here and they guess. I will be dealing with this challenge a little later as to where this place is, where it comes from. Two famous ancient Bible characters came from Haran, not far from Gobekli Tepe. One of them came from Ur, can you remember his name? Abram. Was he acquainted with the history of Gobekli Tepe? Ancient Walid Haran tells about the indefinite time he spent here. That's Terah, his father, and his one brother. And Rebecca, by the way, met the servant of Abram right here. This is where Jacob fell in love with Rachel, the ancient old well at Haran. Many interesting discoveries were made in 2003 at Haran. Did Nebuchadnezzar learn about these people when he fought against the Syrians at Haran? Uh, and the Egyptians at Carchemish. So Nebuchadnezzar and the great armies of the world fought here in this area. Maybe the discovery of future clay tablets will shed more light on the mysteries of Gobekli Tepe. Now, now let's see what the media reported about this discovery of the oldest archaeological site in the world. Gobekli Tepe rewrites human history. Oldest temple and settlement in human history. And uh, maybe you recognize the president of Turkey there. 2019 declared the year of Gobekli Tepe for Turkey tourism. Announced by the president Erdogan. He's on television quite often. Now, the next picture, uh, this is Gobekli Tepe, part of it. The next picture will show you the impression of an artist of how they built Gobekli Tepe. Just look at this. You know, these T-shaped stones weigh, some of them up to 70 uh, tons. So he, 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 he tries to give us an idea of what happened here. Now, do you notice something on this column? Just look to the left. Two arms, mysterious arms and hands embracing the end of the pillar. And there's a strange animal between these two arms. Men and people like to speculate about this. What's this all about? And thousands of people come here to see something which nobody knows anything about. I'm going to tell you what I think a little later. You know, the unexplainable fascinates people. 
Let's go back to the museum. There's the letter T, and you see it at Gobekli Tepe all over the place. Uh, what could this be? What could this be? Another artifacts in a museum. Your impression? Well, you have to say these were great sculptors. Why is it impossible to explain what is going on here? You know, ancient sites like Babylon and Nineveh, uh, there's a description of the history how this place was built, but not here. There is no language to explain it. Look at this funny picture. Sketch. So they wanted to convey a message, but they didn't have an alphabet. Let's leave the museum and drive back to the excavations. Only 12 Ks. Kobekli Tepe. Now I'm always interested in the etymology of words. Where does it come from? Well, Kobekli means a pot belly. Maybe you've got a pot belly. <laughs> then in uh, Turkish, you can call it your Kobekli. <laughs> Tepe means hill. The, the uh, meaning the pot belly hill. And the hills look like pot bellies. Typical example of a hill that resembles an oversized belly, pot belly. <laughs> so if you have one, the ancient Turkish name sounds quite academic. Kobekli. Entrance to the site, this is all newly uh, built. And uh, a signboard telling you more about the place. Now let's follow the arrow. What can we expect to see at this oldest archaeological site in the world, they say? The path leads up the hill. Kobekli, pot belly. It looks like a pot belly. The camera crew are taking as many pictures as possible. And this will be on YouTube soon uh, in South Africa. Almost at the top. Look at the beautiful flowers here. There's so much to, to share with you at this site. By the way, corn was cultivated here a long time ago. So people usually came to places where they could eat. From here you have a panoramic view of the area. Just look at this. It's so beautiful. No wonder they erected their religious center here. The harvests of grain were excellent. Gobekli Tepe, Turkish for Pot Belly Hill, is an archaeological site approximately 12 k's from Sanli Urfa. Now that's another interesting place. Do you see the two letters Ur? Sanli Urfa. Some people believe Abram was born at Sanli Urfa. Now, they discovered more than 200 of these huge pillars, the T-like pillars, in about 20 circles. And uh, they've only excavated four. So there's another 16 still to be excavated. The runes are formed in rings of megalithic blocks, estimated to weigh between 7 and 50 tons. How, you, how do you transport this? And are intricately carved with animal figures. In the museum I saw them dragging these huge stones with ropes. It's estimated that another 50 years of digging could finally uncover the entire site. So my friend, this was a big place of worship. And the site on the Fertile Crescent is very important. People had to pass here. Who did they worship? Who was the first man to discover these mysterious T-shaped pillars? What were his conclusions? In 1994, Klaus Schmidt of the German Archaeological Institute, I met some of the people in Iraq, the place called Uruk, was re-examining Gobekli Tepe. 
and unearth the first of the huge T-shaped pillars. What did Schmidt believe about the cathedral on the hill, as he called it? A pilgrimage destination, he says, attracting worshippers of up to 150 k's distance. Now, on what basis did he make this claim? Butchered bones were found in large numbers from local game such as deer, gazelle, pigs. So this was not for Hebrews. Good point. And geese, they have been identified as prepared for the con congregants. So many thousands of people came here to worship. Schmidt considered Gobekli Tepe a central location for a cult of the dead and that the carved animals are there to protect the dead. So here's a, a place of worship and the dead had to be protected. Here's a bull, a fox and a crane. Though no tombs or, or graves have been found so far, Schmidt believed that they remained to be discovered in the niches located behind the walls of the sacred circles. Here you see this cycle. So they still have to do more excavations. And let's see what's going to happen in future. Let me read you a section of this description. So as you walk there, you can read the description and see what's going on. At the northern end of the building, at either side of the apse, circle form, stand two decorated T-shaped limestone pillars. Smaller pillars, as you, as you see here, can, can be seen facing walls of the building. And then a description of a building C. It is an impressive round oval building with a diameter of approximately 25 meters. While the outer wall belongs to its oldest phase, the inner wall, in, the inner wall was erected in its youngest phase. The inner wall featured a total of nine T-shaped pillars found in situ, through the original, though the original number was unknown. There you, there you have a look at it. This is only one of four. The other 16 still have to be excavated. The building C was erected directly upon the artificially smooth limestone bedrock. You can see it. In the middle, how many concentric walls do you count? One, two, three. Why three? By the way, this was the first temple and the oldest temple in the world. So people came here to worship, but what did they worship? Monotheistic or polytheistic? People like to to research the unknown. <laughs> you will notice that there are more than one circle temples in this picture. Look, it, it goes up, up, up. Each of the four enclosures were buried under 300 to 500 cubic meters of refuse, creating a tell consisting mainly of small limestone fragments, stone vessels, and stone tools. I'm just sharing some of the facts about this place. Why these enclosures were built and then buried beneath soil, we do not know. So they built this and then they covered this with soil. Why? Now future excavations will reveal more. I was just wondering, could the presence of Abram in this area have convinced these polytheistic worshippers of the one true creator God. You know, Abram had a bigger influence upon the ancient world than we can ever realize. I came across the following statement. It says, Abram worshipped the Lord and erected an altar which was a living testimony where he went. So this is the area where Abram lived. So that even the roving Canaanites recognized it. Were the worshippers of Gobekli Tepe exposed to Abram's beautiful object lessons of monotheism 
and the plan of salvation. While we were working on our documents at Haran, the following a thought came to my mind. During their stay in Haran, both Abram and Sarah had led others to the worship and service of the true God. Uh, could these people uh, be from Gobekli Tepe? These attached themselves to the patriarch's household and accompanied him to the land of promise. Now this was a big company that had joined Abram's newfound faith. And religion was the thing of the day, as long as they worship anything. But here Abram comes and says, people, this is the God I present to you. He's going to send his son to die for you. Abram explained to this entire region the good news. These people did listen to Abram. They were exposed to his new beautiful message of salvation by Christ. You don't have to sacrifice your child, he said to the angry, he said to the people, to the angry gods you serve. The creator God loves the sinner so much that he gave his son to die in their stead. Sanli Urfa, Kobek Tepe. Here at Kobek Tepe, I asked this mother if I could take a picture of a precious baby. You know, in those days, if you want to impress your God, you sacrifice your child. So if this lady lived in those days, she had to sacrifice this beautiful baby. Abram brought good news. Don't sacrifice your baby. A God of love is going to sacrifice his son. Now do you notice a little sculpture on the tea stone below the star? There's the star. If you go down you'll see something. Let me put on the another picture. There you can see it. What do you notice in this enlarged picture? Uh, another strange animal. Uh, could this be a predator? This is bigger enlargement. He, he's trying to catch something here. I don't know what it is. It is not so clear, but you're looking at, the pre at presentations of animals. If you look carefully, you can see it. If only we could find traces of human beings here, it would help solving the mystery of Kobekli Tepe. In 2017, a discovery of human crania with incisions was reported, interpreted as providing evidence for a new form of Neolithic skull cult. So slowly we get more info. Some of the thousands of visitors to the site what do they believe concerning life after death? Because this was the great doctrine of the ancient world, polytheistic. What happens when you die? All souls went to the same afterlife, and a person's actions during life had no effect on how the person would be treated in the world to come. So live as you want to. No problem when you die. Listen to this one. Unlike in the ancient Egyptian afterlife, there was no process of judgment or evaluation for the deceased. They merely appeared before Eresh Shikika. Eresh Shikika. Very difficult names. Who would pronounce them dead as their names would be recorded by the scribal goddess Kesh. Nana. Now, Nana is the name of a Sumerian god. Now, Erish Kichal was the goddess of Kur. Now, Kur is the land of the dead, the underworld. Gesh Tinana, queen of the underworld. What a lot of nonsense. The souls in Kur were believed to eat nothing but dry dust. And family members of the deceased would ritually 
pour libations into the dead person's grave through a clay pipe, thereby allowing the dead to drink. <laughs> because I think your throat gets a bit uh, dry uh, when there's nothing to eat except dry dust. What an extreme doctrine of the state of the dead. While looking at this dust storm in the Middle East, I thought of what Moses wrote about the state of the dead. He says, But a man dies and is laid away. Indeed, he breathes his last. And where is he? As water disappears from the sea, and the river becomes parched and dries up. Uh, what does Moses say? How long will the dead sleep, the sleep of death? So man lies down and does not rise till the heavens are no more. They will not awake. Interesting. Nor be roused from their sleep. The words till heavens are no more refers to the second coming of Jesus. So when you die, you sleep. And when Jesus comes, He'll call you to life. And what a day of rejoicing that will be. So my dear friend, don't worry about what's going to happen to you when you die. You're going to sleep, says Moses under inspiration. And God's going to wake you up. Enjoy your sleep, it's coming. The visitors listen to these strange messages of the state of the dead. Listen to the following solution uh, to help the deceased dust eaters. <laughs> Those who had died without descendants would suffer the most in the underworld because they would have nothing to drink at all. Sometimes the dead are described as naked or clothed in feathers like birds. For this reason, it was considered essential to have as many offspring as possible so that one's descendants could continue to provide libations for the dead person to drink for many years. So if you're eating dust and you've got 12 children, man, they'll get you some water to drink. But they also have posterity and they will bring you water to drink. So uh, increase your posterity. Now, what does Solomon write about the subject? He says in Ecclesiastes 9.5, For the living know that they will die. They've not got knowledge. But the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward. For the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Never more will they have a share in anything done under the sun. Ah, oh, this is relaxing. You will not eat dust, you will sleep. Why are the inscriptions missing? You don't see them here. Only pictures. Now listen to this. This changed my entire thinking on the research of ancient civilizations. It says, the antediluvians, these were the people who lived before the flood, were without books laptops, cell phones. They had no written records, no written records. But with their great physical and mental vigor, they had strong memories, able to grasp and to retain that which was communicated to them and in turn to transmit it unimpaired to posterity. You know, this, this statement clears up many problems in archaeology. And for hundreds of years, there were seven generations living upon the earth contemporaneously, having the opportunity of consulting together and profiting each by the knowledge and experience of all. So this was the only way they could convey a fox embraced in two arms as you can see here. They couldn't write. Noah didn't bring an alphabet in the ark. It took centuries before cuneiform writing was finally developed. I did the research on this. It is so interesting. Uh, here, here's the 
the posterity of, of uh, Noah. They couldn't write. So how are they going to contact people? Making notes. Because their brains deteriorated. It took centuries, as I said, before cuneiform writing was finally developed. Now let's move to another site. Another site. From the Fertile Crescent, we move to another site called Baalbek. Now these religious sites were on the highways. So this one, Kobekli Tepe, was on the highway. And now we're going to another religious site, also on the Fertile Crescent in Lebanon. Look at this nameless, solid chunk of rock weighing how much? <laughs> solid. If Kobekli Tepe proudly exhibits their T-shaped stones that, uh, what would you say of, of this little stone? There's were only 70 at the most tons. But look at this one solid piece of a column. Many regard the ancient building materials as pre-flood phenomena. Uh, I think so. It's pre-flood. Ancient foundation on which Romans built their Bacchus temple. Now, if you look to the left of the foundations, you'll see two people walking there. Now, now look at that foundation. That's pre-flood. The Romans came and built the Bacchus temple on top of these ancient foundations. 1,500 tons. You know, I had a big problem to lift this thing for the camera crew. Eventually, I, I managed. <laughs> Why the absence of writing here at Baalbek, as well as Kobekli Tepe? I was asking these 800 ton columns, how they were transported from the quarries, also 800 meters from their sanctuary. They couldn't answer me. Here's a door, 12 feet high. I looked at one of the videos on, uh, on YouTube, and this specific scholar says that these people must have been 12 feet high. Uh, is that feasible? People before the flood growing up to 12 feet, brilliant in mind and body, while investigating these wordless structures. I thought of the importance of the written word. If you don't have the written word, you will not have understanding. Listen to this. I like this. In the beginning was the word. Written. And the word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. In the case of Kobekli Tepe and Baalbek, the alphabet Words to explain were absent. But the readable word, Jesus Christ, was from the beginning. You could read him from the beginning till this moment. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In the case of Kobekli Tepe and Baalbek, the alphabet, words explained, to explain it, were absent. That's logic in, in the light of the statement I've read about the antediluvians. But the readable word, Jesus Christ, was from the beginning. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The builders of these huge columns have all died. What happened to them after death? Let's ask the creator and savior of the human family, to answer this question. How did Jesus describe the death? I'm here at the place where Lazarus was buried in Jerusalem. Uh, Jesus says, <clears throat> our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. He sleeps, he says to his 12 disciples, uh, I'm going to wake him, wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death. 
But they thought that he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. What a beautiful description of death. Sleep. Do you know, sometimes I can't fall asleep. But when I wake up, I realized I had, I'd fallen to sleep. And it's, it's a nice feeling to sleep. You get rejuvenated. In what state was Lazarus when Jesus came to the tomb? John 11, 43. He cried with a loud voice. Lazarus, come forth. Of course, he was dead for four days. And the rabbis re reckoned that after four days, there is no life. Now, what does Paul say will happen with those who sleep in death when Jesus comes? You know, my dear friend, I'm looking forward to hear the call of Jesus calling me on my name, maybe my new name, in the coming resurrection. You know, he had to call the name of Lazarus. Otherwise, all the dead in Christ would have arose contempt. Uh, 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 at the same time. But I think we're going, to get, we're going to get new names, says the book of Revelation. And he's going to call us, I think, on that new name. And we'll recognize his voice. And we'll be resurrected. The first written word started here. This is uh, Uruk. I had the privilege to visit this place where cuneiform language, alphabet, was developed. When I, I, I stood here, a, a verse from Revelation came to me. Maybe you know the verse. Revelation 1.11. I am the Alpha. First letter in the Greek alphabet. And the Omega, the last letter of the Greek alphabet. The first and the last. I love this verse. We have an alphabet. That alphabet is Jesus Christ. Isn't this beautiful? A tomb of a man that's mentioned in the Bible, Arietas the fourth. First John 5 12. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Father in heaven, thank you that we as sinners can accept the Son and have life, eternal life. Help us not to reject the invitation to have you live in our hearts. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you for watching this presentation. To subscribe to our channel, click here then click the bell to get notifications. For the next presentation, click here. See you next time.